Welcome uh, to another discussion group of the American Foreign Military Policy Cluster at the Mershon Center for International, for International Security Studies. Uh, I'm Professor Pete Monsoor, uh, one of the uh, two directors of the cluster, along with uh, Professor Emeritus Rick Herman. And today uh, we are honored to have with us Alex Thompson, who is a professor of political science at The Ohio State University and a senior faculty fellow at the Mershon Center. Uh, his research focuses on the politics of international organizations and law in a variety of domains, including security, political economy, and the environment. He has a longstanding interest in climate change and has published several articles in this area, most, mostly focused on climate institutions and cooperation at the international level. He's also an award-winning scholar um, who's written an award-winning book on why the U.S. sometimes uses the U.N. Uh, for its purposes and at other times goes it alone or uh, bypasses the organization. Uh, today, Alex will give us an update on the state of uh, U.N. climate negotiations and provide some thoughts from the perspective okay. of U.S. Okay. foreign policy. And I will move okay. everyone's microphones <laughs> so that you have a stage to yourself. There we go. All right, Alex. Uh, Alex will talk to us for about, um, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, however long he wants to talk. And then uh, once he's done talking, uh, you can turn your cameras on at that point, leave your microphones muted unless you're talking, and use the raise hand function to ask questions. That is, you can find that under the reactions tab at the bottom of the screen. Alex, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot, Pete, and thanks to everyone for, for coming. As I was preparing my comments for today on the topic of climate change and U.S. foreign policy, I realized Sorry, Alex, I, I mistakenly muted you, so... That's okay. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right. all right. Go ahead and begin again. Okay. Um, so as I was... Well, I don't know when I was muted, but thanks to everyone for coming. Um, and as I was preparing my um, comments today, I realized I, I don't have a lot of um, definitive answers. So what I'm gonna do is really provide some context and set the stage. Um, and hopefully um, we can have a nice discussion. I do have some slides that I'm gonna share. Can everyone see the slides? Yeah, they're up, we can see Great, them. great, thanks, Kate. Um, so I just wanna uh, sort of situate this discussion of climate change and US foreign policy. I'm not sure, I'm sure people have different um, backgrounds and are more or less up to date on where the, uh, on where um, like international climate politics stands. So let me just give a little bit of background. So we just had a new report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's really hot off the presses. Um, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called it a code red for humanity. So a, a sort of warning that we have a sort of a last chance to really deal with this problem. Um, and the IPCC is saying in the latest report that evidence of human influence um, is unequivocal. Um, so they're trying to really set that aside and say, that's not really up for debate anymore. They describe really dramatic changes um, in the climate system um, related to CO2 concentrations, ocean levels and ocean acidification, um, glacial retreat. Uh, it's really just a comprehensive description of all of the changes that are taking place. And noting that many of these changes are unprecedented going back centuries millennia, even in some cases going back hundreds of thousands of years, we haven't seen um, uh, um, the sorts of changes that we're seeing now. They also warn of and make the scientific connection to um, extreme events of various sorts, heat waves, droughts, typhoons and hurricanes, um, fires, etc. So they paint a pretty bleak picture of the potential impacts of climate. Actually, I should say, the current and um, worsening impacts of climate change. So the IPCC reiterates its 
recommendation that um, we should try to limit warming to two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial uh, levels. Um, but really what the IPCC is saying is that we should aim for 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming to avoid the worst impacts. Um, we might be able to get away with two, um, but really we should be aiming for 1.5 degrees. Uh, we seem to be on pace with sort of our current policies. We're on pace for about three degrees of warming by the year 2100. So if we're going to, we really need to, to sort of change that trajectory soon. If we're going to have any hope of hitting 1.5, we probably don't um, have a realistic chance of hitting 1.5. Um, but hopefully we could get closer to 1.5 than to two degrees. Um, but to do that, we would we would need to achieve net zero emissions by about the middle of the century. So that's uh, um, really informing a lot of the policy discussions about climate change right now is this new IPCC report, which happens to have arrived um, just a couple of months before the next conference of the parties. So these meetings are COPs as they're known, take place every year. And these are the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the sort of foundational treaty from 1992 um, dealing with climate change. And the COP26 is coming up in, in Glasgow in early November, basically the first half of November. And this will be the biggest gathering, um, the most important of these COP meetings since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 um, for reasons that I'll, I will explain briefly. Some of the big issues that are going to be um, um, addressed at this COP or that need to be hammered out um, in Glasgow are first um, completing what's sort of affectionately termed the Paris rule book. So, I mean, the Paris Agreement is a treaty, um, and, but it, it's, it, it lays out a number of different uh, mechanisms and processes that all have to be um, fleshed out, all of the details of how everything in the Paris Agreement um, all of the obligations and processes laid out in the Paris Agreement, all of those details have to be worked out. A lot of them have been worked out, but there's still some remaining issues. Um, one of those is the details surrounded, surrounding emissions trading and carbon markets. Um, this is really important for the United States. I mean, it was really the United States during the 1990s that introduced the notion of emissions trading into the, the um, negotiation surrounding the Kyoto Protocol. And it's always been important for the United States to have sort of robust participation by the private sector in the global climate regime. So this is a really important um, goal of COP26, uh, especially from the perspective of the United States is to hammer out all these details. Um, another big priority is to achieve increased ambition in the pledges that states are making to reduce their emissions. So we have a whole uh, new framework now flowing from the Paris Agreement for how countries make uh, pledges to reduce their emissions. The term now is nationally determined contributions or NDCs. So uh, the parties to the Paris Agreement had NDCs under Paris. Um, now they are expected to update their NDCs. And this is the Paris Envision, the process where every five years, countries would update their NDCs. In other words, make new pledges to reduce their emissions. And this is now the first round of new NDCs under this whole Paris process. Um, this is one reason the uh, COP26 is such an important um, one. And according to the Paris Agreement, you're not supposed to just propose a new NDC every five years. That new NDC is supposed to be more ambitious than your previous NDC. Um, so we're looking for a new round of NDCs, but specifically a new round of more ambitious NDCs. So far, uh, 144 countries have submitted new NDCs. Um, 31 others say they intend to do so before the COP. So we'll be watching these NDCs kind of trickle in in the lead up to COP26. Um, the third and maybe even the most contentious issue that will be discussed at COP26 is the issue of international climate finance. Um, this is kind of a, a broad term that's used to um, refer to resources flowing from the developed world to the developing world to address climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, 
there's a legal requirement here. So under the Paris Agreement, uh, the industrialized world is obligated as a whole to supply $100 billion a year to the developing world um, to address climate change. According to the OECD, they haven't met that target. They're at about $80 billion um, a year. So one thing we'll be looking out for at COP26 is whether um, industrialized countries will increase their generosity when it comes to north-south flows of climate finance. Um, but there's also a compelling, it is not just the sort of legal requirement that developed countries have, um, there's also a really sound policy or environmental argument for it. Um, most emissions today are coming from the developing world and in the future that will, that will be even more true. So most of the growth in emissions is coming from the developing world. So we really need to get technology and resources flowing to the global south um, so that they can invest in cleaner technologies and reduce their emissions. Um, it's also the case that reducing emissions is generally much more cost effective in, the, in emerging and developing economies. So it makes sense to try to get emissions reductions where it's most uh, cost effective. And finally, it's in the developing world where we have the greatest need for adaptation. That's where the impacts of climate change are being felt uh, most acutely. So we need some of this uh, uh, aid and other investments flowing to the global south so they can um, um, you know, respond to the impacts of climate change. Everyone agrees that we need much more uh, climate finance flowing from the north to the south. Um, to deal with both mitigation and adaptation. So a big challenge in COP26 will be to see if um, countries can, can pledge to increase these flows. Okay, so uh, I wanna offer some thoughts on sort of what different dimensions of US foreign policy are related to climate change. Um, So I have some different categories here of different sort of dimensions of US foreign policy that I wanna talk about. One is the most narrow, which is just um, priorities for these upcoming COP negotiations. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the big priorities in the months leading up to it and at the COP will just be to reestablish um, the US's leadership role in climate change. Um, so, you know, President Biden rejoined the Paris Agreement um, that was obviously an important uh, first step. Um, and there's been uh, a lot of effort on behalf by the administration, especially by John Kerry, who is uh, Biden's climate envoy, um, to get countries on board before COP26. Um, they've been holding bilateral meetings. They've been using the G20 as a forum to um, um, you know, really hammer out new new commitments and get countries on board before COP26. In April of this year, Biden hosted the um, what he called the Leaders Summit on Climate Change. Last month, he hosted the the Quad Leaders Summit that was Australia, Japan, and India. Um, and one major goal there was to try to get India to be more um, forthcoming um, with its uh, NDC. So we'll see how that. Um, turns out. And then also last month, he hosted the Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate. So this is a group of the 17 largest uh, emitters um, of greenhouse gases. So there's a lot of effort right now in sort of advance of COP26 by the U.S. to kind of reestablish itself as a leader when it comes to the, the diplomacy and the international politics of climate change. And there's, I think, a lot at stake um, when it comes to the Paris Agreement itself. So the Paris Agreement was, was really the, the, um, the baby of the uh, Obama administration. Um, it was really years of focused diplomacy and negotiations that led to the Paris Agreement, which um, is, as, a, as a treaty dealing with climate change at the global level, it was, it really reflected US preferences. It was sort of a wish list of what the United States would want in a global treaty dealing with climate change. I can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, so it's, I think, really important for the United States to preserve the kind of model that the Paris Agreement lays out and to have it be successful and, um, and robust. 
And a lot of the same individuals that were involved in negotiating the Paris Agreement are now involved in the Biden administration, obviously Biden himself. Um, but John Kerry was Secretary of State at the time of the Paris Agreement and is now um, the president's climate envoy. And even Anthony Blinken was Deputy Secretary of State at the time and is now Secretary of State. I think one of the big uh, priorities for COP26 for the US will be to um, try to bring other major emitters along, especially um, China and India. China and India have a you know, distinct relationship to the global climate regime because they're developing countries who traditionally haven't been asked to do as much when it comes to reducing emissions. Um, but there's more and more pressure on them to do so, and they are obligated under the Paris Agreement to produce new NDCs. Um, so there'll be a lot of attention focused on that and bringing those um, countries along. Another uh, important area of US foreign policy is uh, what I'm gonna call mitigation policy. This is basically efforts by the United States to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the US has pledged uh, in its new NDC a 50% reduction uh, by 2030. And then it has joined a coalition of quite a few countries um, that have pledged net zero, so net zero emissions by uh, the middle of the century, by 2050. Um, and one point I'd like to make on mitigation policy is that you really can't separate domestic policy and foreign policy when it comes to mitigation. Um, uh, whether you, uh, your, the ability of a country of the United States to follow through on international mitigation pledges is almost entirely a function of domestic policy. In other words, decisions um, at home to reduce emissions um, of greenhouse gases. And so a lot of that is now caught up in Congress. Um, obviously there are um, regulations under the control of the, the president through the EPA or the Department of Transportation, et cetera. So um, Biden does have some levers, but a lot of the fate of mitigation policy lies in the hands of Congress right now. So we'll see how um, we'll see how that plays out. But I sort of I, when, I, when I say that domestic policy is foreign policy, I, I mean it in a broader sense as well, because, you know, what what comes out of domestic policy in the United States will determine the extent to which the US is able to reduce its emissions. And that ends up being a really important factor in the international negotiations. Um, because of course, the US is one of the world's largest emitters, the second largest emitter. Historically, the US is the, the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. So the more the US can do to reduce emissions, the more other countries will be uh, willing to go along. And the more sort of authority the United States will have um, to try to persuade other countries to, to do their fair share. Uh, another area of US foreign policy that's relevant here is what I'll, I'll call foreign aid um, and climate finance. So there's obviously the question of the, the overall amount, you know, how much will the United, how much more generous will the United States um, be when it comes to um, um, foreign aid? Uh, the Biden administration announced um, Earlier this year that, that Biden announced that he wanted the US to be a quote, a leader in international climate finance and then doubled the sort of commitment of the United States to North-South uh, financing. And then last month at the UN General Assembly meeting, Biden announced that he was going to double that amount again so that the US would be contributing about $11 billion a year um, by 2024. Another area of, uh, or another important set of questions here will relate to sort of development policy more generally. So should the U.S. be reorienting its development policy or its uh, foreign aid distribution with the impacts of climate change in mind? And this relates to the, the last category here, and this is, uh, I'll, be, I'll be done in a few minutes with my presentation, and then you can open it up. Uh, the last dimension, which is national security policy. So there's more and more evidence that climate change um, exacerbates uh, conflict and humanitarian crises. In fact, the, the headline I have here on the bottom of the slide is from a New York Times article that uh, uh, just came out uh, today. And I'm sure some of you have been following the, the research and, and commentary on this topic. So we generally think of climate change not necessarily as a proximate cause of conflict, um, but it can exacerbate 
um, a lot of the variables um, that tend to um, produce conflict. Um, so in areas that are conflict prone, climate change could make the situation worse. Um, and obviously this is gonna have uh, implications for US national security policy. If we're thinking about where we're likely to see civil wars, where we're likely to see failed states, where we're likely to require um, military or humanitarian interventions, basically where instability and strife in the world are most likely to occur. There is also a set of more specific questions that the Pentagon has to deal with when it comes to preparedness and when it comes to adapting to climate change. Uh, where should uh, bases uh, be, be stationed? Where should resources be prepositioned and, and mobilized? Um, how should uh, train? What kinds of training are the most important? How can the U.S. military be most prepared to respond to? Um, the types of crises that are likely to result um, from climate change. And I'd be interested in um, everyone's thoughts on these issues. Finally, my last point, which is that you, when we talk about climate change as a foreign policy issue, um, we're, we're almost never talking about climate policy per se. We're, we're gonna be talking about development policy. We're gonna be talking about national security policy. We're gonna be talking about uh, foreign aid policy, we're going to be talking about trade policy. Um, it's such a cross-cutting issue, and my sense is that that's the way right now that the Biden administration is certainly viewing climate change, which is that it really has to be taken into account in every area of foreign policy, not treated as a distinct um, domain of foreign policy or a distinct issue. Um, I will leave it at that, and I look forward to uh, hearing everyone's thoughts and questions. Okay, well, thank you, um, Alex. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, please use the raised hand icon. Um, at this time, uh, if, if you want to unmute your camera and be seen, so this is like a discussion group, you can, otherwise you can stay hidden. Um, Jim Chanel, you had a question. Would you like to ask it in person? Uh, yes. Can you hear me okay? I, we can, yes. Okay, good. Um, I, I worked with uh, Fort Bragg uh, as a cultural analyst, Indochina stuff, and I, I worked with the uh, Climate Reality Project. That's Al Gore's group. And something I'm trying to find in my work down at Bragg, Fort Bragg is any alignment between uh, U.S. foreign policy leadership in any of these uh, environmental organizations. Are you, are you familiar with any linkages there? Um, what do you mean by environmental organizations? Do you mean NGOs or? Sure. Yeah, NGOs or, or uh, like, again, I, I just use this illustration, the Climate Reality Project. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with them, but that, that's Al Gore's group. But really, NGOs or anything across the board. I'm always looking for ways to tie in the work of these organizations down at Bragg, but I, I don't see official linkages. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't have, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do think, uh, um, that, you know, now you have me, me curious as well. I mean, you can't, I think a lot of people would be surprised if they're not already familiar with it, um, at how seriously, um, the Pentagon and the sort of U.S. military as a whole takes climate change. Um, it, it may be the, 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 part of the part of the federal government that's taking climate change uh, most seriously. Um, but I don't know the answer to your specific question. Okay, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, John Mueller. Uh, yeah, I have... Uh... Uh, the three top climates, I might ask about nuclear power. Uh, three uh, top climate, climate scientists said uh, there is no credible path to climate stabilization that does not include a substantial role for nuclear power. Uh, are they right? Are they wrong? Where is this in this? If they're right, basically, then it sounds like nothing's going to, it's going to just get, become a disaster. Uh, if they're wrong, then there might, it might not be. Anyway, where, where, is the, where is nuclear power? It hardly ever comes up in discussions. 
Yeah, good question, John. Uh, I don't know if I'm the best person to, to ask. Um, I, I tend to be more, uh, maybe more pro-nuclear power than some of my, my lefty friends. Um, uh, you know, for, I guess, there's already so much investment in it. Um, and we have, it's, it's frustrating because we have um, other renewable technology that's, that's proven ready to go. And we're kind of, the, the market is gonna scale all of that stuff up um, and that's gonna have a huge impact, but it's just not gonna have the impact we need soon enough. The, re the reductions we need need to come sooner. So we can't wait for um, wind and solar, for example. So I think we need to um, rely on whatever um, non-fossil fuel sources, you know, sources that we have now, and I would include nuclear in that. So I guess in that sense, uh, at least for the medium term, you could, you know, I would say that I, I, I pretty much agree with that. Okay, it just seems like a disaster without it. Um, it, it, it is proven, it is expensive, but it does work and it lasts for a long time. And so people who do not accept it, unless they say these guys are wrong, that somehow you can get enough windmills going to do it, um, it basically means that it's, it's impossible. They're, they're basically saying it's impossible to deal with it unless you, unless you make that a high priority. Well, I mean, it depends how ambitious your goal is, right? I mean, if the goal is to, you know, keep temperature increases to 1.5 degrees by, um, if, if that's your goal, then they're, they're much more likely to be right. If you're willing to live with two degrees, then, you know, maybe there's more, more room for other pathways. Um, but, you know, given the, um, the current state of affairs, I suspect they're, they're probably right that we would have to rely on nuclear. Okay. Alex, it looks like um, Pete's having some issues here, but I will take over um, on calling on people. This is Kelly. Um, so Dorothy, do you wanna go ahead next? Hi all. Um, Alex, could you say something about how consequential you think the COPT, I'm sorry, the COP26 dynamics themselves are? Um, I'm thinking of this letter that appeared in The Guardian from um, the corporate sponsors, Sky and Microsoft and whoever else, uh, to the British government complaining that junior civil servants were organizing the whole thing and it was incompetent. Do you think governments are going to do what they're going to do or does the event itself, is the event itself critical in, in the outcome? That's a great question, Dory. <laughs> um, maybe it depends what you mean by outcome. I mean, I think for the most part, um, on, on the big issues, most of the delegations are going to kind of know what their positions are going in. Um, you know, you don't wait till you get to the the cop to suddenly decide what your your priorities are in the negotiations. Um, so for the big picture issues, you know, what is your what kinds of commitments are you going to make to um, reduce emissions to supply more climate financing? Um, then I think the probably intra cop dynamics um, aren't that important. However, there's a there's a culture and a community within these conferences of the parties. So a lot of these people uh, know each other. You know the delegates from government. Some governments, by the way, are sending delegations with dozens of people. Um, now this is a little bit different because it's the first cops since COVID started. They skipped last year's cop because of COVID. Um, so the delegations are going to be smaller and some leaders won't go in person. They will, they will zoom in or, or whatever. So I, I'm a little bit reluctant to, to sort of take lessons from past cops and apply them to this cop because I think it's going to be an unusual cop. But answering your question more generally, I think on uh, the, the interactions that take place at cops matter over time in kind of a cumulative sense. Right, like getting to know your colleagues. Who are you going to trust to do the negotiations? Who, um, 
you know, who are you going to trust to represent your interests? Um, who follows through on their promises? Um, I think over time, um, that has mattered quite a bit in these cops um, and the sorts of relationships that they get developed and the norms that have developed within the cops, I think, end up mattering quite a bit. You know, there's certain arguments you can make and certain arguments you can't make. Um, and also one other point I'll make um, is that the cops, because you have almost 200 countries participating, they rely heavily on groups of countries in the negotiations. So it's very rare, maybe I wouldn't say very rare, but countries aren't typically negotiating on behalf of just themselves, other than the United States, which typically is. But it's you know someone intervening on behalf of the African group, someone intervening on behalf of the least developed countries group, someone intervening on behalf of the EU. So it's clusters of countries and fairly formalized groups that are really negotiating with each other. And the dynamics within those groups are incredibly important because if you think about it, if someone's gonna be making a statement or engaging in a negotiation on behalf of the group of 77, then you have to choose who that person is going to be. And you have to be confident that they're gonna represent your interests, the interests of 130 plus countries. So anyway, I think if we really got into it to look at the internal dynamics, we would see that they are, they're very important for um, outcomes in the sense that um, um, sort of harder to see outcomes that accumulate over time, even if the, the content of the, the documents that are being negotiated over, um, you know, even if you might not see a, a visible impact on, on, on those. Alex, I think um, Pete is going to throw it to me, so I'll direct traffic from here uh, for now. Can, can uh, how about you, Reed? I think you're up. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alex. Great Hi. conversation. Um, so I attended a virtual uh, planning session for the DCJ Climate Justice Activists about a month ago. And there was kind of an interesting back and forth. Uh, one of the representatives from uh, the US, again, part of this broader coalition of climate justice activists was talking about their goals uh, for, the, for the COP. And they kind of said like in an offhand way, um, you know, we're gonna try to pressure for the US. We, we, wanna, we wanna be in dialogue with the US to, to assume that leadership role, basically kind of reflecting what you were saying. And somebody interjected <laughs> in the comments and said, we do not want U.S. leadership. The U.S. is the problem, and they've been obstructing. And they, for for three generations now, we've been relying on U.S. leadership to, you know, uh, to do something. And the false promises, basically, the false hope gets broken time and time again. I mean, like you said, uh, you know. Obama wanted uh, the Paris framework in 2009 in Copenhagen and uh, the developing nations, uh, it, it broke the negotiations at that time. They got it in 2015, Trump got elected. And um, you know the bottom up model so far, this is a really testing point. So I, I guess I all, that's kind of the first primary question really quickly building off of um, what um, John brought up the question of nuclear from the climate justice perspective is a false solution because it doesn't actually get at the heart of the crisis, which is one of an economic system predicated upon endless accumulation and expansion. And we need to degrow the economy. And as long as we're focusing on these kind of technological based solutions without actually addressing the, the underlying political dynamics that are again fueling the crisis, we can't address this. So what would be your response in a nutshell for those climate justice activists who are gonna be attending in a couple of weeks? Great, uh, thanks a lot, Reed. Um, well, and I think when I answered, um, you know, John's question, I, I think I referred to the medium term and then maybe in a way, this is a downside of the, the sort of renewed urgency that's been generated as a result of the IPCC report, which is that, you know, it's, you know, when we think there's much more emphasis on reductions in the short run, how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the short run in ways that are measurable? 
Um, and when you're thinking that way, um, you're going to adopt a relatively narrow range of sort of policy options um, and, and thinking. Um, so, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna tend to focus on the options that are available now to reduce emissions. And I think the point you're raising, which is an important one, is that um, possibly as an alternative, but at least in parallel to that, we should be thinking about, you know, much more fundamental issues of how we sort of organize and uh, run our economy. Um, but I think that's where the, you can have well-intentioned people disagreeing over this issue because, you know, um, you know the counter argument to the uh, uh, climate justice perspective is that, well, that's nice. And maybe, you know, we should be thinking about um, these long-term structural issues, but in the meantime, we need to reduce emissions. <laughs> so if you give me some practical options or a practical path forward to reduce emissions by 2030 and 2050, then, um, you know, I, I'm on board. But if you're just going to talk about long-term sort of aspirational goals, um, then that's not going to get us to the reductions we need um, in the short run and the medium run. But I love that you're you're also pointing to this divide, and I've learned a lot from you, Reed, about this. Um, Reed was a PhD student at Ohio State, and he's now at Purdue. Um, you know, there's this divide in the civil society community surrounding climate change, where you have these more mainstream groups that are really working hand in hand with governments. I mean, I thought that uh, Jim Schnell's question was really interesting. You know, are there NGOs, environmental groups that are working with the Pentagon? Um, and it's not far-fetched at all that that would be the case. Um, you have these very mainstream civil society groups that consider themselves environmentalists, but are working right alongside governments and helping them with, with research and policy options and implementation on the ground. But then you have this whole other community um, in the civil society world of much more activist um, um, justice oriented actors that would view with utter suspicion anything that came out of, of Washington, uh, for sure. So I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're highlighting that divide. And one thing, of course, that happens at these, that, at these cops is you also have uh, NGOs and civil society groups descending on these very locations. So they're also very interesting sites um, to watch the interactions among these civil society groups, but also how they interact with the government representatives that are there. You, uh, Shelley. Hi, thank you for the um, presentation. I wanted to just make a quick comment about the nuclear and then a question about the Pentagon. I don't know if you guys know, cause you're not referencing it, but after Fukushima, Germany um, voted or decided that by 2022 is gonna get rid of all of its nuclear reactors. And there's no evidence of supporting that technology in Biden's climate initiative. So even if it may be rational in the short term or a technological solution, there just isn't a lot of empirical evidence that that's where uh, industrial countries are moving toward. But the other question has to do with the Pentagon and your point about adaptation, about bases and training and preparedness. And since the Pentagon issued climate change as a national security threat almost a decade ago, I'm just curious to what extent you've actually seen um, uh, these things be incorporated already rather than just putting it in the future terms? Like what have they done already in these terms? And I'm just not sure about that. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. So on the specifics of the Pentagon, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I know there's, um, and maybe uh, Pete or somebody else knows, knows better than I do. Um, but my understanding is there's a lot of concern about um, sustainability, about where they're um, using renewables uh, to fuel everything from you know submarines to um, um, you know trucks, um, but also in terms of uh, my understanding, at least, is that one of the reasons for investing in and building up Africom so much is that this is an example of the type of sort of repositioning that one might do if you're concerned about um, the parts of the world that would be most impacted by climate change. The Red Cross, by the way, does an interesting study where they, they sort of identify the countries in the world that 
they think are most vulnerable to climate change. And then they cross-reference that with countries that are experiencing conflict. And I think in their latest report, um, they said that of the, of the 20 countries in, in the world that they've determined are most vulnerable to climate change, 12 are experiencing conflict right now. Um, and a lot of those are in Africa. Um, but, you know, on other uh, uh, specifics in terms of Pentagon planning, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to speculate on things I don't um, know about. Your point about nuclear is, is, is really interesting. I agree. I mean, I found the, I mean, I guess it's two separate questions. You know, John Mueller's question was from a technical perspective right. in terms of the need to reduce emissions, would nuclear be, um, you know, an important sort of piece of that puzzle. Um, your point is an empirical point about whether in fact governments have embraced nuclear and this this um, Germany example is is remarkable. I mean, for a country that is concerned about reducing its emissions, mm -hmm. it, at least it appears to have been a direct response to, to Fukushima that they, you know, shut down their nuclear sector at great at great expense because of course those are huge investments. That's right. Um, so I find that uh, to be a really interesting example. And, and you could argue that, you know, well, I guess the next question I would wanna ask, and I don't know, I haven't done research on this, would be how much of a, how much did that set Germany back in terms of reducing its uh, greenhouse gas emissions? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, Edward Bolt. You're muted. You're muted, Edward. There we go, I got it right. Okay, yes. Well, my, my question is regarding, it seems through, through readings, and I happen to read a lot of British publications because our European allies seem to be much more aggressive and advanced in combating climate change, especially with electrification of vehicles. And I'm wondering, because I think the US industry is still they don't want to hurt certain client, certain certain publics, certain publics. Will that cause a rift between us and Europe, as the Europeans feel that the United States is not effectively uh, combating climate change? Thank you. That's a that's a great question, and that's been you know a concern going back to the 1990s when. I mean, actually to the very beginnings of the global climate regime with the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed at the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. And uh, uh, George H.W. Bush Sr. Um, didn't even wanna go to Rio partly because he didn't wanna be put in the position where the European countries were forwarding a treaty that required emissions reductions and the United States would have to say, no, we're not signing on to that. Um, so he basically, you know, pre-negotiated with the Europeans that whatever climate treaty they came up with in Rio would not include emissions reduction commitments. So the rift between the U.S. and, and Europe goes all the way back to the beginnings of the regime. Um, so I do think this is a, a careful, you know, sort of a tightrope that's get, that gets walked in the relationship between um, Europe and the United States, I think there's some appreciation from the European side for the fact that there are different circumstances in the U.S. and Europe. The U.S. was always more dependent on uh, fossil fuels, for example. Um, and now, of course, the U.S. is a major exporter of fossil fuels. Um, so there are, there are different, um, you know, the cost-benefit analysis or the compliance costs are different between the two sides. Um, and that, that helps. Um, uh, and I, you know, one of the, the one, one problem that Europeans have is they've always been such um, on the leading edge, or, or they've always been sort of strong supporters of uh, taking action on climate change. Um, they, they, they don't, they, they tend to have to compromise with the United States because the U.S. is so, um, uh, the U.S.'s role in the regime is so crucial because we're such a big emitter of greenhouse gases and such an important source of, of climate finance, potentially, 
So if you look over the history of these negotiations, what you see is, you know, Europe staking out a position that's much more proactive or precautionary with regard to climate change, the US adopting a position that's more centrist, and then the Europeans sort of compromising much closer to the US position. Because honestly, what are you gonna do? You can't have a viable global climate regime if the United States isn't participating. So that's been the, the dynamic over the years. Um, and uh, you know, I think you're right that it has been and, and will be a source of tension. Okay, uh, sorry about that. I had some Zoom problems, I'm back up. Um, Jerry Hudson. Uh, hi, uh, I, for some reason my camera doesn't seem to be working properly, so you're gonna have to put up with my smiling face uh, <laughs> as it is. You know, um, Alex, when I, when I tuned into this presentation, um, all I could think about was Senator Manchin. And um, you mentioned that U.S. foreign policy is, uh, is almost part and parcel of U.S. domestic policy and domestic politics as well. Um, I'm wondering from what you know uh, of what Senator Manchin is trying to do to uh, Biden's Build Back agenda, whether uh, Manchin is, is actually almost able to undercut uh, any progressive initiatives that the United States might try to make at the upcoming conference. Yeah, I mean, we're sort of watching this unfold uh, it's like a sort of slow motion car wreck. <laughs> um, and it's not the first time we've been in this, we've seen this play out. And it's not just with the United States where you have, um, you know, leaders of countries making commitments, but then everyone can see what's going on at the domestic level. And they can, they can uh, get a sense themselves of whether those commitments are gonna be realistic or not, given domestic political obstacles. Um, and I, I think you're right. I mean, uh, without Manchin on board, they're going to be really important parts of um, the sort of suite of policies that Biden would, would otherwise have relied on to reduce our emissions um, aren't going to be available. Um, so I, I, you know, I, in some ways, the situation isn't that complicated because it's fairly transparent what Manchin's interests are. Um, he is, after all, a senator from West Virginia, and he happens to be the pivotal voter on this stuff. So he's, um, you know, sticking to what he thinks, um, um, you know, to a position that 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 he thinks makes sense for him, and it's going to have implications not just for U.S. domestic policy, but for U.S. foreign policy, and it could shift the dynamics of COP26. Um, going back to, to Edward's point, um, you know, is this going to affect the willingness of, you know, maybe not so much the European countries, but if you're China and you're India and you're being pressured by the United States to do more on, on mitigation, um, you know, you might very well point out that um, just because the U.S. has promised a, a 50 percent, just because the U.S. has promised net zero by 2050, which is sort of what the U.S. is pressuring India and China to do, they might very well respond by saying, we all know perfectly well that, that you're not going to be able to do this because look at the state of uh, legislation in, in Congress right now. Yeah, thanks very much, Alex. Thank thanks, Jerry. Jerry. Rick, you had a question. Okay, Alex, uh there's been an ongoing discussion in the chat that I'm sure you haven't had a chance to follow, which is why don't India and China have higher goals and what's the arguments for and against them having lower emission standards? And maybe you could address the issue. There's a number of chat uh, items on this front. Right, okay. Um, so India and China, um, are developing countries um, in the broader sense, but in the specific um, uh, context of the climate regime. Um, and so from the beginning, there have been different expectations and obligations imposed on um, developed countries versus developing countries. 
Um, so, uh, and there are a number of arguments for, you know, why that makes sense. Um, you know, historically, uh, developed countries are responsible for um, the majority of uh, emissions, um, but also emissions per capita are still much higher in the industrialized world. So, you know, if you look at um, a list of the highest emitters, you would see India in the top 10. But if you looked at emissions per capita, India was much lower than, um, you know, US, Canada, Japan, Australia, etc. cetera. Um, so the, the argument from the developing world in general has been that, you know, we are willing to reduce our emissions and even to make commitments to reduce our emissions. But it's gonna look a lot different than the types of commitments that countries in the global North uh, are making. And it's going to be contingent on these flows of climate finance that I was talking about. So most developing countries argue that, you know, we are happy to work on reducing our emissions, but at least part of that should be subsidized by the global North who are historically responsible and have more resources, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, China is starting to I think China and India are in a somewhat different position now. Um, so let, they both have NDCs, these nationally um, determined contributions. Um, neither has submitted a new NDC, um, but I think they probably both will. I think India probably will, um, but their NDCs look very different. So India's NDC is in terms of the sort of emissions intensity of its economy. So it's not just an economy-wide absolute reduction in emissions, it's how uh, emissions intensive its GDP is. Um, and then they also have, um, their NDC also includes certain policy goals like moving towards renewables um, and planning uh, forests, things like that. Um, so there, there's much more leeway that's expected for developing countries or that's accepted um, for developing countries um, so anyway, that, that gives you some of the, the context or, or background. So even though China is the, now the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world as a, as a country, um, it still has some of the, you could say, sort of uh, protections or differential treatment that has traditionally been afforded to developing countries in the global climate regime. So Alex, I don't see any other hands up, so I'll ask a question. Given the problems with the politics of reducing admissions. Um, isn't this really just going to come down to a matter of economics? If uh, the cost of solar power and wind power and geothermal power um, comes down to a level where it's cheaper than oil, we're going we're gonna to adopt it. And if not, we're going to continue to burn hydrocarbons regardless of what it does to the planet. Um, I, I sort of agree with you, but with some caveats. So, you know, the, it's one thing to say the cost, I mean, it to a large extent, the costs have come down. Especially uh, solar. Yeah, but I guess the question is, can we, can we afford to just wait for the market to take care of the problem, which, you know, eventually the market will take care of the problem. Um, the question on the table is, what are the policy levers that governments have to accelerate that process? Because what's clear now is that we don't have time to wait for the market to take care of the problem. So. Um, for example, are there ways that, um, and, and especially when we're talking about the developing world, because most of the future emissions are going to be coming from the developing world. So it's great if the market starts taking care of the problem or, you know, reversing emissions in, in Germany or the United States, but we really need to be focused on Nigeria and Indonesia and India, right? This is where future emissions are going to come from. So the real question is, are there things that governments could be doing now to accelerate that process that you're describing in the developing world? Can we cause uh, one coal plant not to be built <laughs> and instead to have uh, a cleaner plant built, right? And that'll have a payoff for the a whole generation. Um, so if we can get these interventions now, um, and if we can calibrate them to kind of accelerate these, these forces that we are already seeing in the market, um, then that would be much better than just waiting. So there, in other words, there's an in-between option where um, 
uh, you're not just you're waiting for the market, but you're doing things intentionally to accelerate those processes and spread those technologies and and investing in research that can help to scale them up more quickly. One of the things that would really help is battery technology um, that could store large amounts of electricity. What are the what's the prognosis for development? I mean, that's something I think governments could really put a lot of R and D into. Because if you have battery batteries that can store large amounts of electricity, then you have cars that can travel, you know, more than uh, a few dozen miles before you have to plug it in, and uh, you have ability to store large amounts of electricity from solar panels and so forth? Yeah, great question, Pete. So, you know, there's some technologies that are basically ready for prime time, <laughs> you know, like solar and wind. Um, and then there's another category of technologies that are, you know, not quite there. And that's where I think a lot of these investments need to go. And that probably needs to be public money to use the, the jargon rather than just relying on uh, uh, market forces and investments. And so I would include you know, battery technology in that category, maybe along with carbon capture and storage, um, maybe along with um, you know, how to make air transportation um, more efficient, maybe how to make uh, um, cement production more efficient. So I think there, there are a number of areas where it's kind of the next line of technologies that we're going to need to rely on to bring emissions down. Um, and they're not as far along as, um, um, you know, some of these renewables technologies that we've talked about. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that. And, and fusion power, if we, you know, that's the holy grail, obviously. Uh, California recently had a law uh, passed a law that basically said all small engines like leaf lawn brower, lawnmowers, leaf blowers, et cetera, have to be electric. Uh, mm. They won't allow the sale of any more gas, uh, small gas engines. And if you think it's a minor thing, California actually um, predicted that all the small engines, the emissions are actually greater than the emissions from the cars in the state. And where wow. California goes often go other, other states. Uh, Rick, you had a question. Yeah, Alex, when I was in high school, which is ancient history, of course, the popular concept then was uh, Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb. And I've been reading some of this chat by uh, Reed Kurtz about degrowth. And so 50 years ago or more, the concern was with population growth, but I don't hear in the climate discussions a linkage to population growth, which when I was a young man, that's what uh, the focus was on. So it's just, I got curious, is there any linkage between the politics of population growth and climate change? That's a good question, Rick. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say there isn't much. I, I don't want to say there's no linkage, but I don't hear population being talked about as a like policy option. And it's not like there's some working group in the conference of the parties on, on population. Um, so I, I guess my my simple answer is I, I don't I don't think so. Okay, um, I'm afraid uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Alex, you have any final thoughts before Kelly puts up the slide of uh, the upcoming events again? Uh, no, other than to to thank everyone, and I hope that you know, as a result of this discussion, you know, now that we, we can all follow the news of the. Um, COP26 coming up and, and maybe we'll find it, uh, you know, a little bit more interesting or we'll feel a little bit more uh, prepared to kind of consume and interpret the media reports we see coming out of COP26. Well, I've done my part. I uh, am getting solar panels put on my roof uh, this year. So there we go. Um, Kelly, could you put up the slide on upcoming events? Uh, on behalf of the American Foreign Military Policy Cluster at the Mershon Center, thank you for attending. And if you like this event, you'll love the ones we have coming up, Mary Cerati uh, discussing um, why our relationship with Russia went south after the uh, end of the Cold War. Ian Johnson on his new book on um, the Russian-German military relationship in the interwar period and uh, a discussion of the US foreign policy towards China. All these coming up in, um, in November. So look for invitations uh, to be coming out soon. Uh, thank you once again, and um, have a great weekend, and go Bucks.